Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest in our Future Of series presented by Jobs Ohio. We have an exciting conversation today on the future of agriculture, sustainability, and water innovation. Uh, with Ohio's kind of strategic location and having agriculture such a driver of our economy, the location that we have bordering the Great Lakes and Lake Erie in specific, and a lot of our businesses uh, leading on things in the sustainability world. This is going to be a fascinating conversation, and we're grateful that you're able to join us today. And we're also grateful that we have three leaders that are working in each of these areas and doing something unique and interesting that we'll hear from more in a moment. But to start, I uh, want to thank everyone and a little bit of an introduction about myself in this series. I'm Chris Berry, the president of OhioX. We are a statewide technology and innovation nonprofit working to help build Ohio into a tech hub. And so what do we do? We connect, we promote, and we advocate. Uh, and as a bit of a tech trade association for the state, we have businesses of all shapes and sizes from Fortune 500s down to startups and everything in between, university systems, and research centers that have joined and helped fund and support and partner in this effort and initiative. And we're grateful for them for making this happen. To connect and follow along for conversations, topics, content like this, we'd absolutely recommend and welcome you to follow us and connect on social media. We're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter, we have a YouTube channel where this recording will be posted. So some of you watching now are probably uh, seeing this after the fact and part of our content streaming services. Uh, today's event, as I mentioned, is part of a, a series. It's a year long series that we've been doing in partnership with Jobs Ohio called The Future Of. And each month we've been taking a look at the future of different sectors, different industries, different areas, and how Ohio people, companies, and ideas are building the future and what to expect. And so we started with healthcare, talked about government, real estate, insurance, education, cities, commerce, sports, travel. This month today is agriculture. And then next month to, to end this year long series is finance. And so, as I mentioned, you know, we're examining and looking at all the different things that are happening and all the excitement and innovation and tech progress that's going on right here in Ohio. Um, as we have this conversation, there's a, there's the Q and a chat function. If you hear something or have a question or a comment or feedback, toss it in the chat. You're also welcome to message me directly. If you have a question, you'd like to see us work into today's content today, as I mentioned, we have three leaders that have joined us for this future of agriculture, sustainability, and water innovation. I'm gonna ask them to each introduce themselves and kind of share the perspective and background they have. But we have Pete Blackshaw from Centrifuge, the CEO down in Cincinnati. We have Tim Derrickson, who's a Senior Director of Agriculture and Food Sector at Jobs Ohio. And then we have Brian Stubbs, who is the President and Executive Director of the Cleveland Water Alliance. And so they're each kind of doing something different. We have Cincinnati to Cleveland represented today. And that's what's fun about it. There's so much happening in our state. And so I'm going to stop sharing and ask each of our speakers to do a quick introduction of themselves, their work, the perspective that they're bringing to this conversation, kind of brag on what they're doing. And so Pete, we're going to start with you uh, and tell us a little bit about Centrifuge, just who you all are, what you're doing, what's happening in Cincinnati with the tech world. And then kind of on top of that, if you could, a little bit in sustainability to tease what we'll be talking about today. Yeah, sure. First off, uh, wanted to give a shout out to Jobs Ohio for sponsoring this. I, I definitely am feeling, I think these conversations are critically important. We need to do more of them. And I'm really uh, grateful. We just had the uh, CEO of Jobs Ohio on our annual meeting, and it really, really helped to get a lot of the critical business leaders and stakeholders engaged. So super, uh, su super grateful. Yeah, so I'm a California native who's landed in California. I've got a blend of big company and startup uh, experience. Um, I'm running um, Centrifuge, which is a startup catalyst and, and fund of funds. I think what makes our model unique is that our fund of funds model is um, comprised of about 120 million in invested assets from some of the biggest um, corporations and businesses and private investors in you know, Southern Ohio, Northern Kentucky. And we use that to basically um, invest in the world's top venture capital firms, which gives us access to technology connections, people, and then ideally over time, you know, um, you know, dials up local deal flow. And a good example of that is um, one of our more recent investments, 5AM Ventures, was a principal investor in Syncor, which just 
lured, I think, our second largest uh, VC raise a couple of weeks ago, about 143 million, and they're in the biohealth area. So we're trying to do a lot of that. But we also help startups. Any startup who walks through the door, we have a 40,000 square foot uh, maker space. Um, we'll help them in any way possible. We um, are trying to focus in a few areas where a concentration of talent, technology, and capital can have an outsized impact. So while we'll talk to any startup who's dialing up any issue, we do believe there are a few areas that disproportionately matter. Um, FinTech is a big one, and obviously Columbus has a great story there, and we're trying to dial that up in Southern um, Ohio. But the other area is what I would call sustainable supply chains. Um, and we, are, we have huge incumbent strengths in supply chain. Cincinnati's the, Greater Cincinnati is now the number one e-commerce distribution hub in the country. But with that is coming a much higher order of accountability, responsibility around sustainability. And every business plan that we are seeing uh, coming out of the big co's or even in the e-commerce space are setting some really big and important goals in that area. And it's led us to believe that there could be a really potent startup economy. Um, and we're nurturing that in every way we can. Part of my perspective is informed having spent eight years in Switzerland running digital globally for Nestle, the world's largest food company. So I got really, really close to the food ag business, but importantly, the controversies around it and the incredible growth that was coming to bear from what we would call ankle biter companies that were pushing into the green, sustainable, healthy food area. And it was a real wake up call that that is where the puck is moving. That is where companies need to innovate. And it's not a lot different when you look at the Kroger's and the P&G's and the cows, the Duke Energy, everybody to kind of preserve and grow jobs in Ohio. We have to develop this sector and we have to do it with a sense of urgency and a recognition that every state in the union, heavily incented by federal carrots right now and millennial pressure, our kids are moving very, very fast in this area. So I'm looking forward to this discussion and I'm hoping it can keep the momentum going. All right, thanks so much, Pete, appreciate that. Now we'll go to Tim Derrickson, who, as I mentioned, is at Jobs Ohio working in this food and agriculture sector role. Um, and as you can see in his background, has a bit of a history in this space as well. So Tim, <laughs> welcome and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Chris. And uh, Pete, I appreciate your passion, man, I, I, and where you're coming from. It is such a um, ever-changing sector right now in food and ag. Uh, briefly about my background, as you can see in my background, uh, I was a dairy farmer, a fourth generation dairy farmer uh, in Southwest Ohio. Uh, no longer milking cows. And I'm so I'm glad that they're behind me and not in front of me anymore. But I still really appreciate that heritage that um, my family offered me. Um, but that's where my heart has always been. And I've spent a career in, in, in the ag industry. Um, like I said, first 30 years uh, milking cows. My wife and I started a couple of businesses uh, on that farm, um, served in the legislature for eight years where I was pretty involved with workforce development related um, legislation, as well as agricultural uh, related uh, bills. So kind of has kind of stayed grounded in that, in that realm. When I turned out um, of the house, I went over to the Department of Agriculture as assistant director uh, during the uh, um, case administration and ended his term as interim director. Stayed there up until about a year ago um, as assistant director of ag. And so, you know, in that role, I was, I was on the regulatory side of ag. So um, now having graduated yet again to the economic development uh, arena of ag, I've, it's kind of gone full circle for me. And it's really a very interesting sector to, to lead. And that's what I'm doing now is leading this particular sector for Jobs Ohio, who, who focuses on 10 different sectors, one of which is food and ag. And I'll, and I'll just tell you, this particular sector is as busy as it, it's really, I think, frankly, busier than it's ever been. If you take a look at my pipeline of potential projects, man, it's full and it's fun. And, it, and it's just across the board. But I think if, just for me, just to step back just, just a bit uh, in this introduction, what, what, I, what I'm seeing is, is a bit of a um, courting of the food and ag sector with the health sector. Um, and, and if I take that a step further, I, I think that that courting 
was compliments of the introduction by the technology sector. Um, the, the three of us from a sector perspective are really working very closely together. Uh, the technology that has been afforded and is being utilized uh, on, in the, in the, on the farm, in the, in the ag community, uh, and the uh, awareness and interest from retail consumers of food um, are driving this, this conversation. And it will continue to drive this conversation as far as dollars, uh, innovative new products, healthy new products. Uh, ultimately, I think it changes uh, public policy because not only do, do our consumers uh, want to eat healthy, they want to know where, our, where their food is coming from, um, but we're finding corporate interest like never before in sustainability uh, approaches to, the, to this entire food chain. So, um, and I think Pete had mentioned some companies, um, just about every large company that you can imagine, whether they're in the manufacturing of or retailing of, this food sector, they have set some sustainability goals that will influence the entire food chain. So what a fun topic. Chris, thanks for initiating this conversation. Well, thank you, Tim. And, and we'll yeah. definitely be diving into to some more of this in a moment, but I want to give Brian an opportunity uh, up in Cleveland, working in the water innovation space, which again, I think personally, I, I kind of geek out on it because you know we have these incredible resources of the Great Lakes and Lake Erie that uh, our state is lucky enough to be bordered on. So uh, welcome, Brian. Thank you so much for being here. And if you could, just a little bit about your work. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate you uh, having, having us on. And um, just for a little bit of background, I'm a reformed entrepreneur, deep experience in innovation and sustainability initiatives in uh, Chicago and San Francisco. I was recruited to Ohio a decade ago to manage a uh, international sustainability program under a three-year contract. And I just, I haven't looked back. Uh, my family and I have just loved it here and settled in the community quite beautifully. Um, seven years ago, I took on this role of standing up the uh, Cleveland Water Alliance. So the Water Alliance is a water accelerator and cluster that works through industry, utilities and government and research institutions. Um, the water economy is one of the fastest growing sectors here in Ohio, as well as worldwide. Uh, water stress is uh, on the horizon no matter where you, uh, you live. And you know, for us here in Cleveland, what this means is you know, we're seeing 300 net new jobs added each year in the water economy space. So very exciting. Um, our work focuses on market-driven push and pull throughout the sector, be it the digitization, advanced filtration, monitoring, and energy usage of utility management. That includes some of our great companies here like Eaton, Gorman Rupp, Parker Hannafin. Uh, we look at things like the water nexus for smart homes with companies like Moen and Odie. And of course, our, our initiative, the Smart Lake Erie Monitoring Program, which you know helps on other, other initiatives here in the state like Governor DeWine's H2 Ohio program, trying to assist them in bringing smarter and better tools for managing the ROI of that program. Um, we do this through a dynamic market-based programming, starting with our test beds and open innovation challenges. Um, our test beds offer something that's been sorely missing in the water economy industry, nationally and internationally, which is the ability to test, scale, and bring to market new innovations within the real world environment by plugging innovations in directly with customers and the market buyers and obtaining real time, real world feedback from end users. Other test beds exist out there, but they're disconnected from that uh, kind of in the environment and with the customer. That's such an important aspect and part of getting your product to market. Um, the first two test beds are up and operating and center around the first one being an open water watershed and the second some muni utility test bed. Um, initial funding for these came through a, a federally very, very competitive grant program through the US Economic uh, Development Administration. And we were the only freshwater innovation cluster to receive this award. And it was a $1.2 million award. And then thanks to Senator Matt Dolan, we've just received a $3 million investment from the state of Ohio into not only growing these first two test beds more robustly, but also to begin to stand up our third test bed, which is an industrial water treatment and technology uh, test bed. Um, in our first uh, year of pilot operations, which we're coming close to just finishing up year one, we expected, you know, four friendly applicants in the test bed. 
we're not advertising, we're not telling anybody about this yet, but we ended up with 11 um, new innovations, new technologies with solutions coming from as close as Columbus and as far away as France and Israel. And then there will be a fourth test bed that we'll start working on next year, which is a residential commercial test bed. Um, also, we, we launched two industry-driven open innovation challenges this year. The first is with Moen. Um, I hope you all know that name. They are the largest plumbing fixture company uh, by, by volume worldwide, and they're based here in Ohio. Just a great company. And we're working with them on an in-home smart detection system point of use that uh, we are looking at a whole new product line uh, for them, a whole new revenue line. So really excited. And the second open innovation challenge is with six of our utilities from Cincinnati, Akron, Cleveland, Conneaut, uh, a, a private Aqua Ohio company, and, um, um, and a few others that uh, is working around detection of lead service lines without breaking ground. A huge need, all one only need to look at Flint, Michigan to know why we're, we're going down this road. So look, we see our test bed and open innovation work as a, a worldwide driver our goal is real simple, turn our region into the home of freshwater innovation. You know, we have the ingredients to do that. We have the workforce. We've got over 300 water economy companies just in greater Cleveland alone. And then one final point, and, and Chris, thanks for this opportunity to kind of brag a little bit, but we're also working on attracting water intensive industries out of water stressed regions. As a partnership with Cuyahoga County and Team Neo, our Jobs Ohio rep, um, we'd like to say from a climate perspective, Northern Ohio is very boring. And from an industrial perspective, that's a good thing. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, there's so much we can dig into and we'll start, but uh, I'd welcome again, any comments in the chat or DMs to work it in or, you know, Tim, Brian, Pete, you know, hop in as, as, as folks are talking, but Pete, we'll, we'll start with you. And, and Brian, I love to hear you're talking about, you know, the ingredients that Cleveland has. Well, Pete, I've heard you talk about the ingredients Cincinnati has for the sustainability, you mentioned some of the big corporate partners, but, and, and I'll, I might get this moniker wrong, but I believe it, the sustainability highway, is that kind of being great, built? The great supply way. The great, great supply, supply way. way. Yeah, so, so tell us a little bit about what makes Cincinnati unique to you know, your passion and what Centrifuge and the community, business community is doing around sustainability. Yeah, and again, I'm gonna talk about Cincinnati, but I do want, I think, it's in honor of interest to almost kind of like elevate this to state of Ohio and Midwest in general. Cause I do think as, as, as I've been listening to um, both of our esteemed speakers, I almost kind of see this trifecta of, of kind of, you know, agriculture, yeah, sustainability and water. And I think the question we need to ask ourselves is like, I think we all need, you know, we know we need to innovate. Everybody has to innovate to survive, but what are those step change levers to really differentiate Ohio, the Midwest relative to other places and to actually make us competitive with, with places like Europe or Asia where there's just an incredible amount of innovation in these areas. And yeah, I mean, I think ag is definitely one of them. When I look at 80 acres, which is, you know, kind of started in our backyard now is extended up to Hamilton. I see this massive untapped competitive advantage for food, you know, kind of ag tech, sustainable, you know, kind of green tech, um, you know, in Southern Ohio and beyond. And like, how do you scale that? How do you make that a much bigger idea? How do you leverage the unicorn alumni there to kind of create more sustainability plays? I couldn't agree more on the waterfront. I mean, I mean, at Nestle, that was the issue. I mean, our chairman used to say, we're going to run out of oil before you, we're going to run out of wa water before you run out of oil. And he's right. And if we don't manage that properly, and there are some, uh, as a Californian that's parachuted into Ohio, I've kind of discovered these incredible water advantages that we really haven't tapped into, um, even in places like um, Hamilton, Ohio. And then on the sustainability side, I mean, you know, we've always been going far back to like, you know, 150 years ago, kind of a great supply way of trade. That's what's always made Ohio great. And I think the Cincinnati corridor in particular, Northern Kentucky, it's particularly unique now. Obviously it's the subject of all sorts of uh, national discourse around broken bridges and fixing them to kind of make sure that trade can run through, but it's bigger than that. It's now, you know, you've got Amazon, DHL, both of them consider um, that region kind of a, a, a national or global headquarter, Wayfair. Uh, Kroger has gone from top five, top 10 to top five in e-commerce. Thanks to thanks to COVID, um, and so 
yeah, you've got this great supply way of, of, of kind of good services, ideas, and all of them are dependent on sustainability to be competitive in the marketplace. Everybody in e-commerce will tell you that there's massive pressure. And what I think we need to be thinking about is how to turn that into a big competitive advantage. If Amazon is investing heavily there, and we know that they're also investing billions in sustainability in Seattle, how do we seduce them to Southern Ohio, Northern Kentucky to kind of do the same thing? If we know that Kroger and P&G are putting real moonshot goals in their ESG reports, how do we make sure that Ohio gets its fair share of that investment? But that means we have to be competitive because you can't fault them for going elsewhere, whether it's Germany or Singapore, to kind of figure out the future of packaging. So we have to be really smart at ensuring that these companies who are under massive pressure, it's not just regulatory, it's our kids that are basically saying, if you do not deliver here, we will not buy your products. And then how do we make sure that we're building a great green supply way economy around those opportunities? And I do think the opportunity for incremental job growth is massive. I think a lot of it is protection, but I think incrementally, there's all sorts of industries that could unfold in this area. And I'll give you one example that I'm particularly passionate about. And every time I talk to someone at the top of our local universities, I'm literally pleading them. I think carbon analytics is gonna be a massive growth space and we will all be furious at ourselves if that industry develops in New York. When I co-founded the first interactive marketing at team at P&G, all of the market research firms, the digital firms started in New York, no one questioned that. But if we really think about like where the next five, 10 years are going, how do we get in front of that analytic space, which is gonna create billions and billions in value, could put a lot of our universities on the map if they recognize it early on that this is where the puck is going. But again, it's that notion of being very intentional about where we think this green economy is going. And I do think Glasgow gave us a lot of cheat sheets. Okay, so it's not rocket science. You can just follow the targets and make sure that we deliver it first. But that's what I mean by it. We're a great supply way already, but that, that supply way is becoming green. And a lot of incentives, I mean, whatever side of the political aisle you are, those incentives are real. You know, So we might as well take advantage of it and turn it into a big job juggernaut for us. That's great, Pete. Thanks so much. And, and Tim or Brian, feel free to hop in. But Pete, as you were mentioning, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the recruitment, you know, Brian, your comments a, a bit ago about, you know, reaching out to companies in climate challenged areas and, and letting them know about the Cleveland, Northeastern Ohio, the Ohio region, and kind of not so much related to kind of agriculture in this kind of, but as we talk about climate, there's a reason all these big tech companies have been putting their data centers in central. Oh, huge. Yeah, it's, it's massive. And so, Brian, I'd be curious from your perspective, as you're, you know, thinking about or looking at some of these companies, you know, what what is the, you know, what makes the Great Lakes region, Lake Erie, Ohio, you know, obviously, you know, we live here, we know the weather, that type of stuff. But what, what are you telling these companies as you're looking to get them to your part of the country? Well, bef before we do that, I, I do want to respond to one thing that Pete mentioned that I, I think a lot of us in the state need to wake up to. And, and you know, he mentioned around carbon. Um, we see tremendous opportunity around combining water and fintech. And, you know, carbon is one of those. One only need to look at the investments we're putting into wetlands right now as part of nutrient reductions, as, as part of our goals, a 40% reduction of nutrient. But those wetlands also offer extensive carbon sequestration opportunities. And we, if we're not front in line and figuring out how to monetize that for the long-term health, um, economic health, and not only just environmental health, but economic health, and then shame on us, because it's right there in front of us, and we should be doing that. Now, you know, getting to your question, we've always said, you know, Lake Erie has been the, uh, the, the Petri dish of, of innovation, but also the Petri dish of, um, of the Great Lakes. It's the canary in the cold mine, because on one hand, it's the shallowest um, of the Great Lakes, it's only 2% of the water, but it's 50% of the biodiversity. And because of that, we have a great history of companies that have played in that space. 
we have something here uh, called the Cuyahoga River that used to catch on fire. And, you know, it's now making incredible progress, but it's made incredible progress because of great technologies and companies coming in and remediating industrial waste. So the pitch is really simple. We have the talent. We have things like test beds. We have the companies. Uh, you know, look, the cluster concept is, is not a buzzword. You know, it's, it's true. It's no different than what happened in Silicon Valley. Companies, and we pitch them on a, on a few different things. So from a, from a water solutions perspective, so technology play, it's to come in here, you get the trial and test bed, you get all the support services, you get companies like the Kineticos, like the Jets, the Moens, the Odies, uh, the Parkers that are doing deep research on, you know, really fascinating topics like biofiltration is a huge industry in the water economy space. So we talked to them about that one. It's a, it's a great soft landing. It's really cost competitive to do business here. It's really good supply chain. People don't realize that we actually have a port here, a vibrant port that's growing. We're working right now with the port of Antwerp on a whole smart shipping corridor. So getting your supply chain in and out is a huge opportunity. I mean, just look at any headline right now. And that's only going to, the stresses are only going to increase um, you know, in terms of supply chain disruption. So we have a huge opportunity there. And then, you know, you, you hit on this and I hit on this, which is, you know, when we talk to food companies and, and tech companies, semiconductor, it's like, do you want to spend millions upon millions creating a water reuse system? And we've got companies that, that play in water reuse and we like it, but it's cheaper and easier to say, I've got capacity here that's already built out, that's already modernized. I've got a workforce here. I've got training programs, whether it's the community colleges or Case Western or our state colleges. It's, again, the ingredients are there. Well, Thanks, man. Brian. Tim, I'd love to welcome you to, if you have any kind of thoughts or comments, and then, you know, more broadly, perhaps talking about the role of agriculture, you know, broadly and the role that it has in our economy and just the driver it is, because I think that really showcases the economic upside and opportunity that, that, that we do have. Sure. Um, Chris, let me just start by saying you've got three guys here that would like for this to be a conference, like a two-day conference versus <laughs> an hour program. <laughs> I can see that already. So I, I'm not going to spend too much time on that comment, but I think that's true. Um, uh, to, to pick up on Pete and Brian's comment about carbon, um, I, I, you know, it's kind of interesting that the interest that the ag community has in this is pretty real. Um, it's a potential market that hasn't existed in the past. And we're seeing participation in a number of, uh, I think Brian mentioned the H2 Ohio type programs that, that uh, help in this effort of sustainability and um, carbon sequestration. And I think that, that the ag community is really paying attention. We're just trying to figure out where that market is and how we fit into that market. Um, but, but let me back up a bit to the question, Chris, about, the, about this sector. It's pretty uh, significant to the state of Ohio, the agricultural sector. We know we're really blessed with, with great soil, uh, uh, innovation. Uh, we've got th about a little over 13 million acres of tillable farm ground, um, 75,000 farms. You know, you can do the math, but that equates to about 180 acres per farm. The economic impact is $124 billion. Now that's the entire food chain. That's from John Deere making the tractor to Kroger stocking the shelves and, and everybody in between. But that, that is significant, you know, to the state and it's vital to the state. And, you know, what we've got is a community, an ag community who um, they're in business to make a profit but we also have a community, that same community that is very conservation minded. Um, change doesn't always come easy, but an appreciation of a clean Lake Erie or other waterways, frankly, is, is sincere. Uh, and I do think folks are implementing technology and programs uh, to be more um, sustainable than maybe they have in the past. And, and the, the willingness and the cooperation that we're having in the ag community from the H2 Ohio programs is almost off the chart. Uh, you, you've talked with the Department of Ag, uh, Director Planda and others. They're very pleased, as is the governor, with the amount of participation in these programs. Now, they're being compensated for these programs, but they are, they are new best management practices that many of our 
farm community are implementing that they haven't done in the past. And all of this really is leading to cleaner water that, that Brian's really uh, passionate about, that we all are passionate about, and we need to be, because that is definitely, water is a resource that is vital to many industries, not just food and ag by any means. But, but anyhow, the, 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 the um, sector is vital to this state and sustainability, regenerative agriculture, there's lots of terms that we can use, but the desire for this community to be conservation minded is real. And, and I, I do find it interesting now that um, the, the community has kind of taken a beating, frankly, environmentally over the years. Um, but, and I think HD, and I compliment that administration and Governor DeWine for implementing H2 Ohio. And now that we see the willingness to participate in these changes, I think, and the addition uh, of a potentially carbon markets that hadn't existed in the past, uh, we're seeing a community who wants to participate, who wants to help in the overall sustainability of our, of our state and of our waters and of our soils. And so it's exciting to see that willingness um, of this community to participate in these kind of, these kind of practices. Now, I, I will say that, uh, and I don't know if it's social media or just public awareness, I think COVID has stepped up uh, the timeline a bit, but I think we were going there anyway, that ultimately the consumers, you and I, when we were going to a grocery store and buying products, um, we're paying attention to the label. We're, we're, we're interested in where that product came from. Um, I know this sounds kind of maybe crazy, but we're, we're the, the cows that are behind me, the milk that I buy off that shelf, I want to know what farm it came from. I want to know how that cow was fed, the conditions under which that, that cow lives. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, that's a little bit extreme, but people care. And that public opinion is going to drive public policy. Uh, our, our corporate citizens, and it's mentioned many times, but while you, while you guys were talking, I wrote down uh, some companies that I know of that have set sustainability goals. I don't know if they can reach them or not, frankly, but the goals are significant to their companies. Some of these company names, uh, Procter & Gamble, Kroger, Cargill, Nestle, Danone, Amazon, McDonald's, Walmart, we, we, huge companies. And they, they have set these goals that will not only are they going to try to achieve them, but their means of achieving these things will be through public policy. So I really believe public opinion, wanting to eat healthy, corporate sustainability goals will, will drive that, that discussion in our state house. Uh, and it will change opinions, it's, it, it's going to, and uh, how we you know, uh, pass legislation and address this subject at, at that level. So I, I, I think what excites me as an old farmer, as an old legislator, as an old bureaucrat in the Department of Ag, is lots of change and it's all for the good. And there's no one that I can identify that's not on board. Thanks, Tim. And, and it's yeah. interesting because you know, we, we've now talked about and, and had you know, a few comments from, from all of you around the change coming and how it's you know, kind of that bottom up, the millennials and, and Pete, you mentioned kids and, Tim, social media and just kind of where we're at as a society and, and what consumers are calling for. And then recently Glasgow and, and the, the big climate summit in Scotland and kind of from the, you know, heads of state and heads of corporations are, are working on this. And so, you know, we see this change coming. We've talked a little bit about the opportunity. And so, you know, the data analytics, those types of things. But Pete, I'd love to start with you around, you know, if you were, if you were, uh, you know, president of Ohio for a day, you know, what, what were, the, what would those things be? What, where do you think the focus as we look for a year down the line, five years, 10 years to really capitalize on the opportunity that we know is coming? What, what do you think are those recipes and the role kind of technology and companies, et cetera, can play? Well, I'll say at a high level, you know, president of Ohio, whatever, whatever the term is, <laughs> but, you know, if you had to kind of the blank check, I definitely think we need at a policy level, um, I just, I feel like we need a kind of sustainable, kind of a, a real sustainability strategy, kind of a competitive strategy, ideally kind of hovers above political lines, which I think is quite doable because there is so many, so many business implications of not acting 
quickly in this area and like every state is kind of competing. So I think, but you know, some type of, I hate to use the word industrial policy, but like a green, you know, Ohio great green supplyway strategy that really is deliberate and looks at a five-year plan, 10-year plan, looks at the different sectors, um, you know, and, and understands which ones are going to move really fast. Maybe we have a little bit more time in agriculture than we do in winning the carbon analytics market. Um, but it's just got to be very coordinated. It's going to require a lot of, you know, the best ecosystems in the U.S. are very well coordinated between business, government, um, you know, community, even, even there's a big book that just came out by um, um, one of the big ecosystem builders in Seattle, who was one of the early founders in Amazon. Um, I think to, to Tim's earlier point, a lot of this is happening right now. And let me just give you some perspective. Yesterday, hours ago, Proctor just announced, you know, one of their biggest recent acquisition. What was it? A beauty care brand that's 100% sustainable or something like that. If you look at that message, you would say, oh, that's how Proctor is going to grow. In about 20 minutes, Kroger is going to have a live presentation featuring a dozen startups, very diverse startups, I would uh, add, in the kind of the food, uh, the zero hunger, zero waste area. They've given out 2.5 million. This isn't five years out, this is today. Last week, I was at the Ernst & Young annual meeting. They give the best entrepreneurial awards. Uh, they were very, very deep into carbon analytics and into a whole different type of green accounting to help companies, startups to big co's understand um, the implications of these new incentives that are being created. So it is literally happening right now. And I think we just need to get folks in the conversation, keep excitement really high on the possibilities. I think that's what helps people transcend, you know, some of the political polarization and kind of figure out where to play, where to win. We're trying to do that in Southern Ohio. Um, and it's a discussion, you know, it's a conversation. Um, and then who are the critical stakeholders? I think universities, for example, have made a ton of progress in recent years with innovation districts. I would like to see them get a little bit more deliberate in specific areas. I think they're in a great job in health, but it makes me mad when I see that Stanford is getting a ton of money from corporates and the government alike because they're creating a school of climate change or whatever you call it. You know, maybe in Ohio, we have to call it the school of sustainability, but we just need a more thoughtful strategy to move a lot faster. And even then, we, I guarantee you, we will not keep up with the companies. The companies have to move at lightning speed to remain relevant. And there were marketplaces, but the state can't be too far behind. So Chris, I can I can hop on that with just a few really quick points. That's, that's some green, um, you know, some some good call outs. But um, infrastructure um, is a buzzword, but it's a buzzword for for a reason. And I would think through being even more innovative than we have been. You know, starting with how do we fund infrastructure? Let's look at green bonds. Let's look at century bonds. Let's match our infrastructure with the life of that infrastructure. That's something the state could put a program in today. I look at what Governor DeWine has, has done with H2 Ohio. It shows that people understand that we've got to invest in water quality and it's a driver economically. Um, you know, so I mean, I think we can build upon that if I was president for a day and it's always gonna be myopic. Uh, but, you know, I would take it a step further and, you know, I'd be curious, um, on, on Pete's thoughts on this, but we're trying to start going down this road of creating an entire K through 12 blue STEM program. I think if we can get K through 12 engaged with where we have strengths in Ohio. So for us, it's gonna be whether it's, you know, somebody by the time they're ninth or 10th grade is developing a autonomous surface water drone. And that training then goes into a program with a company here. To me, that's a home run. I'd, I'd love us love to see us go down that road. That's great, Brian. Thank you. And, and Tim, I, I don't know if you have any uh, thoughts. And uh, you know, you've been. I don't want to be president for the day. I don't <laughs> want to do that. <laughs> that's my only thought. Gives me kind of a sink my stomach. When do you say that? Um, you know, I, Pete's comment about H two Ohio. I, I just, you, you know, when that when when the governor first introduced that, I wasn't sure how it was going to turn out. But I'll tell you, the line was long to sign up for these programs. And it was a very, it's really intended for the entire state. Uh, but uh, the Lake Erie Basin was, is, is in more trouble. Uh, so we've got more phosphorus running north than we have nitrogen running south of the Ohio River, but it's all a challenge. 
Um, but we you know we even had to narrow that down to the Maumee Basin, frankly, feeding Lake Erie, obviously, because of the dollars that we ultimately had allocated. But that has expanded to 24 counties and the sheer number of acres. And I knew it before this call, but I'm not going to guess because I'm not certain. But a very high percentage in that basin has been has signed up for one or multiple programs. And so I just think the success of that has afforded an agricultural community to, to do things that they may not, they may not have otherwise tried, and they're finding success, success in it. Um, what would I do as president, even though I wouldn't want to be that person? Um, I'd continue those kind of efforts, that kind of encouragement, uh, because it is, it is expensive, and it's in it's it's a big change in what was maybe normal prior to that program existing. And but uh, but the willingness. Boy, it is absolutely there from the community. I would encourage yeah. that to continue. Hey, I wanted to pick up on something Tim said earlier about transparency. And I think that topic alone could keep us busy um, for another 12 hours. But I think that, um, you know, that's an area where, you know, I, I chaired a task force on the future of supply chains, Kroger, PNG, the airport, and DHL. I mean, all the CINTAS. And that prospect of radical transparency of understanding every aspect of the supply chain where it is is a really really big opportunity um for some companies it could be a threat because the consumers may not like you know um the global sourcing they may want more localization but we know that it's going to change behavior and we do know that the shopper level it's getting much easier to interpret those signals and i think we're going to see tons of innovation so we should assume that you know, radical transparency is going to become infinitely more accessible and that's going to have big consequences. And we need to figure out where we play in that space. So I know Cleveland talks a lot about blockchain, but is it blockchain that's the big idea or is it radical transparency enabled by blockchain? Like I think, you know, blockchain and when I was testing blockchain and ag at Nestle, it was really about how it helped to source the milk, um, you know, all of the food products, you know, end to end. And how do we get really, really good at that? What are the requirements of our kids in understanding that? How do we get them involved early on in projects? Um, I think sometimes the Bitcoin and the Coinbase stuff kind of gets too much buzz, but in fact, um, there is a relevancy to sustainability, agriculture, and water that we could embrace and potentially do better than anyone else. But we need to understand what those enabling technologies are. How do we kind of cultivate startups around that? How do we partner with the right players and how do we move faster than anyone? That's great, Pete. And Brian, you had mentioned, you know, the role of, I think you said maybe 300 new jobs per year, continuing growing in kind of this space. And you know, I'd be curious, you know, with your all's work in, in helping build, accelerating, attracting new startups, because that's, that's an audience that our community has a lot of startups, tech companies, you know, what, what are what are you seeing there? The types of companies that are coming to Cleveland or working in Cle or pilots, whatever that looks like. Um, like what just what's the diversity to it all? Well, it's it's broad, but I'll give you two real world examples right now that we're working on. The first is a a French company that we've been working with in our open innovation challenge. And of course, we want to be their landing spot here in the United States. But what it is, is a analytics AI model for highly predicting hypoxia in the utility treatment system. So worldwide hypoxia, oxygen starved water wrecks havoc for a variety of reasons, but also with, with the Great Lakes region because of water intake the water has to be treated differently with different chemicals. So this helps supply chain issues, this helps manage cost. So it's, in this case, deep analytics, you know, it's it's the, the, the engineer wonks and nerds that we all love and the ones that we go out for drinks with at night. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, we just brought in a, um, it's gonna be a $6 million pilot with a South Korean technology. And what they are hitting, hitting us for is one, to manage this pilot with a local utility, but then find a manufacturer for this innovation. So it's going to be everything from digitization of water is a huge opportunity. We can't get enough engineers. So right now we're doing a lot of work around, hey, 
you thought you wanted to go into uh, transportation, you know, the, the next best transportation startup. Have you thought about water? Because I can get you a job today with Moen as, as a software engineer, as a design engineer. So it's going to be a lot of opportunities like that. But then with our sector, it still goes down to, we're gonna need some really cool manufacturers as part of this. And that's that's the thing that we're really, really excited about is, you know, it's just not the coolest, newest gadget. It's actually feeding into another one of our strengths here in Ohio, manufacturing. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And one of the areas that I, I love hearing about because manufacturing the water and our strategic location, you know, all that feeds into consumer goods and, and the role Cincinnati has played in that. Um, but as we start to kind of uh, wind up this conversation, and I agree, this could, this could be a week-long conference uh, with, with a lot more to talk about. Um, we'll, we'll do a couple quick round robins, which I'll just kind of go, I'll go Pete, I'll go Brian, I'll go Tim, and each time. So first one, and this is a fun one we like to, to end with, but what, what's your fair place in Ohio? So maybe you're recruiting one of those, the French company from out of town or uh, inviting in some of your Nestle friends from Switzerland or something like that, Pete. Uh, but where in Cincinnati are you taking them to show off the city favorite parts? I absolutely love the OTR district uh, over the Rhine. That's where I did launch my first startup. It was hugely instrumental in drawing talent. And I just think it kind of captures that, you know, it's old versus new. It's kind of like this innovation trifecta of design, um, food, and technology, they've got dozens of these incredible beer cap, beer beer caves below the ground that are always fun to show folks. And it's got that urban feel that I think is so important. I do think diversity and innovation share a symbiotic relationship uh, and we need to keep cultivating that. But yeah, bar none, I, I personally think, you know, I mean, I, I visited the world's great urban centers, you know, old towns in, in Europe and there is nothing like over the Rhine anywhere. I think it should be a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And I think it could be a crown jewel of how we try to lure talent into, into Ohio. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Love OTR. Uh, Brian, how about you? Well, we'll, we'll start with um, a libation in Ohio City. Then we uh, stroll over to the Rock and Roll Hall. Then we hop <laughs> on a boat and go visit some of our uh, Lake Erie buoys just to show off the technology and then we have them text a buoy and the buoy texts them real-time information back. Very cool. Well, uh, next time up in Cleveland, maybe not in the winter, but <laughs> in the summer, <laughs> you can get a trip up. And Come on, can, we're Ohioans. We can take the cold weather. Up, uh, up 71. Uh, how about you, Tim? Uh, so, um, you know, politician Tim here can't pick one. There's so many, uh, but uh, you can put me in a farm field and I'm pretty content. We're in a barn working on a piece of equipment and I'm pretty content. But I will say last week, I, I enjoy places that I'm surprised by. And last week I was up in Erie County at a, at a facility called the Vegetable Culinary Institute um, that was just a surprise. Uh, this, this business started, facility started as the chef's garden, which it continues to be the chef's garden. Uh, they're raising uh, uh, vegetables indoor and out and providing chefs internationally with, with vegetables, but they also have a facility that I uh, uh, attended an event at and the meal um, prepared by chefs. And there are chefs from around the world that go and train there was absolutely second to none. And the facility was beautiful. So uh, today it's Erie County and the, and the Vegetable Culinary Institute tomorrow, it'll be someplace else. Thanks for asking. Great answer. Great answer, Tim. Um, we'll do another one, Pete, Brian, Tim is the order. But as we wrap this up, we've talked about a lot. What's, you know, one prediction or one thing that you're looking forward to watching play out in your space in this conversation? So it could be around sustainability, water innovation, ag. Um, and we'll, we'll start with you, Pete, of, you know, one thing that's kind of you're looking forward to seeing how it plays out or a prediction that you're calling the shot now. Yeah, and this is something that I'm actually trying to shape. So hopefully uh, odds are higher. So um, I, I anticipate, we, we know that gaming is one of the biggest consumers of uh, kind of, you know, attention these days. It's, you know, bigger than most ad models. And that's why P&G is having big conferences. And, um, and I think there's going to be a huge convergence of, of, of gaming and sustainability. And right now, I'd say 99% of all 
gaming is kind of focused on violence, killing, you know, Fortnite, all that stuff. But I do think uh, there's going to be, you know, the, the youth kind of like are in the games, but they also want to save the world. And I want to converge it. And I'm trying, I'm working with a lot of players um, at Miami and else to kind of create like the world's first green esports league where we can take these great challenges and gamify them. I mean, gamification is the secret sauce to like solving problems faster, but keeping people really engaged. And I'm a particularly excited because I'm trying to find the things that Ohio can do better than anyone else because we discovered it before anyone else. And, um, and so it's kind of a prediction that I'm hoping that I can shape over time, but I'm building a lot of momentum around it. <laughs> Within a couple of months, we'll have green gaming, um, you know, uh, sessions in Union Hall, Cincinnati. But um, I think it's a big idea. And I think we could have a big impact on training our youth around um, big, bold challenges, but also prime our startup economy a lot faster. Very cool. Well, I look forward to following along on that one for sure. So Brian, how about yourself? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think one of the things for us is going to be what we call the digitization and monitoring um, being much more uh, prevalent throughout society for, for water. Um, you know, when I think through what, you know, the buzzword RNA, you know, as it comes to vaccines, we've been using RNA based technology now for monitoring invasive species, as an example, but also for monitoring wastewater treatment for the emergence of diseases. Uh, that's a really cool opportunity, but it starts to show you how we're thinking of whole home health and water has a key piece to, to play within there. Uh, we've got a dynamic partnership right now with, with UH, Eaton, and Moen around what that whole home, smart home system looks like from a water and health perspective. So it's going to be really big, a lot of fun emerging things coming from, from that. And thankfully, you know, we're, we're, we're on the edge of that. So again, Ohio leading and, uh, you know, one final thing is just to mention that while Cleveland's in our name, we're statewide, we've got partnerships throughout New York and Michigan and even in Ontario. Thanks, Chris. Great. Thank you, Brian. And, and Tim, why don't you perfect uh, conclusion to this, a little bit on the future of agriculture for you, what that looks like and what you're looking forward to seeing. Yeah. Well, let me just uh, take your audience to the farm and imagine yourself on a farm and um, imagine seeing a, a tractor and an implement going through a field. Imagine that tractor being driven by GPS and not a driver, a farmer. Imagine the implement depositing nutrients using digital maps and only depositing those nutrients where they're needed and not where they're not. Imagine going into the barn uh, to a dairy farm and seeing cows being milked by robots and not a person. Or imagine yourself going to a controlled environment, agricultural facility, growing vegetables, whether that be vertical or uh, greenhouse-like facility, um, and knowing that there's no pesticides, no chemicals being used, and knowing that the turnaround time for that, for that head of lettuce or that parsley is less than a month, and that they're continually year-round producing product. And you don't have to just imagine it, it's happening every day. And so the technology that's implementing this sector is just off the charts. And I suspect that will continue. Um, technology, health, food, we're all coming together and working as one because we need to. And we're gonna to continue to see advancements. We're gonna see major investments. I'm sure Pete already knows this in, in all of these fields, but it's gonna to continue to drive change and it's all for the betterment of our communities. Thanks, That's Chris. great. Tim, that was a perfect way to, to conclude this conversation. And, and again, I wanna thank each of you, Pete, Brian, Tim, for being here, sharing your work. This is a ton of fun. And again, I know we could have kept going. So I uh, appreciate you throwing so much into to our hour that we shared. So uh, thank you again. Thanks to our audience uh, now and in the future on demand. Uh, thanks Jobs Ohio again for helping yeah. make this and so many like this conversations possible. Um, it's, it's an incredibly exciting time for tech and innovation in our state and from Cincinnati, Columbus, Cleveland, uh, all over Erie County. Uh, so much going on and it's, it's really cool and fun to be a part of. So let's thank do a you. Whole com let's do a whole conference on this. I mean, I'll help out in any way. I'll get a bunch of big companies to participate, but it'd be a shame not to continue this 
I, I think I think we hit some really good themes and I um I would if any of you guys have heart or energy to continue it, I'd say let's do it yesterday and I'll I'll contribute in any way. It's it's I'm, really important conversation. I'm with you. I'm with you, Pete. I'll, I'll in. You're getting an email from me in a minute. So okay, uh, excellent. <laughs> we'll, we'll start it. And and for the audience, you know, you get a sneak peek first to hear about it. So thanks everyone. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.